afternoon. Uh, welcome everybody to our webinar this evening, Safe and Comprehensive Refractions from Across the Room to Across the Internet. My name is Dave Taylor. I'm Director of Product Management and Business Development at Reichert Technologies. And tonight I'm really pleased to present two wonderful speakers, James Timmons and Howard Freed, to uh, talk about this subject and entertain questions and have some fun. Hope you're not all webinared out from the past year. We promise to make it concise and interesting and useful. So let's get going here with a couple of uh, agenda notes and housekeeping items. So uh, our, our speakers I've already introduced, uh, Jim Timmons is going to talk about the current landscape here, what's going on around us and why this subject matter is relevant to us all this evening and the evolving standards of care. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the subject of digital refraction um, and of course, records for Opter VRX is part of that subject matter. And then Howard Freed is going to talk about teleoptometry and digital optometrics, which is a really fascinating subject that I know you'll enjoy. And we'll have a Q&A session. Um, speaking of Q&A, uh, we would ask you to, if you have a question, to type it in, please, uh, on your GoToMeeting control panel on the side of your screen. There's a section where you can type in a question. And I'll be kind of fielding those questions and uh, directing them to the appropriate person to respond to. Somebody already asked a question if the webinar would be recorded for later viewing. And yes, the webinar is being recorded and um, we will let all the attendees who uh, registered know how to access that recording after the evening is over. Uh, we also have a few handouts over there in your GoToMeeting control panel, a few useful documents that you can download from there. Um, there'll be a couple of audience polls during the evening that we'll launch and uh, you can vote on, kind of make it fun and, and interesting. And at the end of the webinar, please take a minute to take our survey, just a couple of brief questions about how we did and whatnot so that we can uh, improve and do better next time. Uh, so that's uh, enough out of me, I think. I want to introduce um, our first speaker, Jim Timmons, in a moment here. Jim is a graduate of Ohio State University College of Optometry. That is residency at the Chillicothe VA Medical Center. He's the chairman of the Department of Clinical Sciences at the State University of New York. He developed the Glaucoma Institute there, um, where he was the uh, first director of that uh, Glaucoma Research Center. He co-founded Ophthalmic Consultants of Connecticut, which is a multidisciplinary referral practice that provides secondary and tertiary care. And he's received numerous awards for his service Lots of publications and uh, in glaucoma, dry eye, cornea, external disease, and refractive surgery technologies. I'm sure you've all seen Dr. Timmons on the podium at a show in the past. Our second speaker, Dr. Freed, tonight is a graduate from John Hopkins University, State University of New York College of Optometry. He's been practicing for over 20 years, owned and operated a commercial optical lab in the uh, New York metro area owned and operated retail optical businesses, uh, and is the president and founder of Digital Optometrics, which is a solution that permits patients to receive a comprehensive eye exam that can be performed by a licensed optometrist from a remote location for the patient. And as a result of that, he was named <laughs> top 20 innovators in telemedicine in 2020 by Technology Innovators Magazine. So two great speakers. And now I'm gonna kick it off by Getting rid of my camera, get my ugly mug off your screen, mute my microphone, and turn it over to the real professionals here, Dr. Timmons, to talk to you about digital refraction and why it's more important now than ever. Dr. Timmons, I'll advance the slides for you. If there's any problems going on, just tell me. Well, Dave, thanks so much for the introduction, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, hopefully, you'll, uh, I think you'll find this very interesting. I have been overwhelmed by the technology. I've had it now for almost two years or so, maybe a little bit longer. And uh, you might ask, you know, I, I spend my time talking about ophthalmic disease and glaucoma and dry eye and refractive surgery issues. Why would I talk about this? Well, it turns out that I also talk about new technologies and it's one of my favorite topics. And this is a technology that has really come of age. And I think for all of us, there's some very vivid and real applications now. And I think into the future, the applications are even more robust. So Dave, next slide, please. So everybody's been through a horrific year. You know, I, I'm sure I, I talked to so many of you and 
you know, we, I talked to friends across the country, I talked to friends in the New England region, Connecticut. Um, it's been difficult and everybody's had to make adjustments. And one of the issues that has risen in that arena relative to making adjustments is the ability to undergo a telemedical consultation or some form of remote interaction with your patients. Um, just saw a, a survey that said 35% uh, of all practices will continue to actively use telemedical interface for their patients, even after the pandemic's over, because it's such an efficient way to uh, essentially triage individuals who are presenting to the office. And we certainly did that. And I think that it has been, uh, I just did two today. I average two or three a day. Patients will call in, we'll do a triage visit over the phone, and then I'll make a decision as to whether we see them. Uh, we then get the information and we send it forward. So I think most of us have, have at least attempted or participated in that venue. And that says a lot about what Dr. Freed's going to talk about later relative to digital optometrics, which is a mechanism to effectively provide remote services in this dimension to patients who are either patients in the practice or new patients or individuals who can't attend the practice because of other issues. So um, we are in a new world and all of us are gonna to continue to make those adaptations. And I think this is very interesting. Next, next Dave. Look, our office has completely restructured itself. I'm sure yours, all of yours have as well. That restructuring was based on your decision to follow the recommendations of the CDC uh, your regional and your you know, national, regional and state governments. And in large part, it decreased the number of patients in the office. We all know that. It challenged our ergonomics, our flow patterns. And it also put us and our staff at risk of contact with patients relative to the proximity that we have to obtain in order to examine and the duration of the time that we have to be there to examine as well. So we, we see so many patients in the office. I mean, I just saw 44 patients today, but within the context of that, we did a reasonable number of refractions, not for general care, but for patients of mine who are longstanding medical patients who need, who need updated prescriptive services or just for the simple fact of understanding what their best visual acuity is. And I think that's, that's a critical part of the overall assessment. I have so many patients for which the pinhole is a total bust, as you all have, I'm sure, and you stick them behind a four opter, and all of a sudden their vision's infinitely better, and some of your concerns have been washed away. So increased safety and physical distancing, much more efficient, and we'll talk about how that fits in here in a second. Patient convenience, uh, you know, this is a little bit more in Howard's presentation, but certainly a, a convenience to individuals who use it in this larger domain. And then improved care, which is, I, I think, a, a remarkable step forward in the four after world. Uh, next slide, please, Dave. So this is a little bit of a summary, you know, a much safer environment, and we'll talk about how that happens. Um, increase in efficiency and throughput, I would absolutely agree with that. You know, I typically am not the person who does our refractions. Although right now, because one of my externs was unable to attend this uh, semester, we uh, everybody's having to chip in and I, I will go ahead and join the staff and do whatever we need to do to get the day done. And I did about a half a dozen today, uh, but I like to do them in this room and so does my staff. So we'll talk a little bit about why. Improved ergonomics, very important. Um, I think the differentiation is interesting. Patients are kind of overwhelmed by this. It's like, oh, you're over there? I said, yeah, I'm over here. We're controlling everything remotely and I can actually do this. And we'll, we'll do some flipping of lenses or changing of eyes without touching the foropter. And they really appreciate the fact that this is a different level of technology than what they've been presented with previously. Uh, patient convenience, certainly that's truth. And then increased focus on medical care. As I said, this is a large part. You know, if you're providing medical care, one of the endpoints is best corrected vision and comfortable and safe vision for your patients, regardless of their uh, presenting clinical signs and or final diagnosis. Uh, next, please, Dave. Well, this is the first opportunity we have for an audience poll, Dr. Timmons. So I'm gonna uh, pop that up. It should come up on your screen. We'll read the question out. Everybody gets a chance okay. to vote. Um, since we're on the subject here, launch the poll. 
Do you utilize a digital thoropter in your practice? Hopefully you're seeing that poll on your screens right now. Uh, the votes are coming in. Right now it's about 37% yes, 60, 65% no. So it's, it's shifting back and forth a little bit, but hovering roughly around 60, 40. Uh, so two thirds, yeah, two thirds, one third. Yep, yep, exactly. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna cl close that poll and it should be back over to you now. All right, yeah, next slide, that's great. So look, safety is a real issue. And for those of you who may have had either an exposure to COVID and had to quarantine, uh, who have had staff members who have been exposed and or have had quarantine or had COVID or whether you've had it, I can certainly give you a personal experience. I made it through nine months of literally month-like life and the day after Christmas, I was diagnosed with COVID and then spent uh, a pretty rough two and a half, three weeks after that in and out of the hospital and doing some other things, kind of recuperating and then getting back onto the uh, onto the onto the office uh, sort of protocols and 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 moving forward with my schedule. But that was tough, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. One of the ways to remove that is physical distancing. How does this work differently? I'll show you in a second. This is really remarkable. And this is actually one of the things that we love from the beginning is I don't have to be anywhere near the four opter. Neither do my staff. They can be in the room. They could be in another room if they wanted to with the Bluetooth technology and the cabling that's available. But we simply moved it a significant distance away from the room, uh, from the four opter, sufficient enough that they had their, their normal CDC approved six feet of space. And it really has changed the parameters of the examination. Uh, next, please. So the other thing that has just been a godsend is this device is connected to all of your other devices. And as a result of that, the, the technician or yourself or myself will walk in the room and ARAK will already be in the four opter. You're not dialing anything and you're walking in, you're beginning the journey. It's a much faster and much more efficient process. So you have ARAK, you have the price, you can get the patient's prior lens RX and put that in as well. And you can actually program those in and then simply flip from one to the other and say, this is where you were, this is what we found today. It's a brilliant way to provide refractive analysis as opposed to the old school, which is, well, I can't really show you where you were because I have to click 17 lenses, but trust me, you're gonna see this better. This is a vivid example to the patient and I think it really helps them understand dramatically whether this is a notable improvement or whether it's simply a push. And both of those are important because if you're going to prescribe something, that's an issue. Um, I love the fact that I can change optotypes while I'm refracting because the device actually has the ability to simply operate multiple modalities. Uh, utilize EMR to transfer all the RX information. So when we're done, you just push the button and it automatically goes to the EHR. You never have to worry about transcription errors. You don't have to worry about things getting lost. This is Bluetoothable to your devices or you can have cables, or you, it's, it's Bluetooth transfer, right? Um, I love the fact that when we're done and you simply say, yes, final RX, you go boom, right over to the EHR, and then that goes out into the patient's hand in the form of a printed document when they decide uh, that that's what they wanna do when we're done. This has been such a smooth transition for us in the office. Uh, programming sequences. I don't use this as much um, as I probably should, uh, my standard sort of refractive style is mine, and uh, you can actually program that in, and it'll automatically set you up. Obviously, it has plus or minus cylinder, which is fantastic, because in some practices, you have people who like one or the other. Uh, most of optometrists, is, as we all know, are minus cylinder people, but if you work in a mixed practice like mine, some of my colleagues trained in plus cylinder, they found this amazing that they could actually go old school and do this and not have to convert over. Um, it programs refractive sequences. So if you have a way that you like to refract a patient, you can program the sequence and it automatically will follow that sequence if your technician's doing the refraction so that they mimic your style and your pattern. And I think that's something that's really critical. You know, you can teach somebody how to do things, but in the end, you still have to have a system or a style. And this is something that allows you to do that. Whereas with standard four after it's not possible at all. And you can also program the acuity chart in a number of different ways. So you can go horizontal, you can go vertical. You can do that with other systems, but this links it into the four opter that we have and it also allows you to manage it from remotely. So next slide. Um, 
this is a little bit of a comment about where we're headed. And you know, Howard and I have talked about this uh, extensively. And this, this is such a, an interesting and fascinating concept, especially with all of the remote testing that we're doing. I'm doing remote visual field testing now. We're soon gonna be doing remote uh, imaging testing in a, in a uh, study that we're doing with one of the local clinics. This is the future, colleagues. There is, there is no doubt that this is going to happen. Uh, remote evaluation of your patients was done throughout COVID with telemedicine, and there were some limits on that. You, know, you could limit it to the anterior segment. This changes the entirety. I mean, you, um, we're talking about refraction now, but you know, in the right setting, you can actually physically examine a patient remotely from where you are, so long as they're in the office. And that's amazing to me. Uh, not that I would want to be in the Bahamas doing refractions, because if I was in the Bahamas, I wouldn't be doing refractions, but uh, or general examinations or comprehensive assessments, but it has the capacity to do that. And Howard's going to elaborate on that. I think you're going to find this really fascinating. Uh, next, please. Ergonomics. This is interesting. I don't know if you're aware of this, but one of the primary diseases of optometrists and ophthalmologists, if you look through the literature in, on the, on, on the uh, medical side is a simple fact that we end up with neck problems, neck and back problems. We are constantly hunched over the slit lamp. More importantly, rotator cuffs are one of the common problems that optometrists and ophthalmologists suffer or the technicians are there because you're constantly sitting down and reaching up. You know, one of the things that I learned quite a while back from one of my early instructors, uh, at SUNY, one of the people I met, not my instructor, one of my early faculty at SUNY was, I refract standing up. Why? Because if you reach up all the time, your rotator cuff's gonna go. We put ourselves in these micro ergonomic stress moments and this device just completely eliminates that. You're sitting in a comfortable position. You have control of the device. You can have it on a little table. You can pull it up close. You can tuck it back into the wall. You can do it from across the room which is amazing. You can be 10 feet away. You can be two feet away. Uh, your choice. Love the fact that you're in a comfortable place. You're doing it in an easy and uh, comfortable environment. And I think it also makes the concept of the, of the examination less sort of strained. I know a lot of times you'll be standing there. It's like better one or two, better one or two. This is easy. Touch the button, touch the button, touch the button, touch the button. Uh, you can also face your patient while you're doing this. You can get a sense of whether they're right with position properly. Uh, there's a lot of advantages. And you can see what your patient is seeing on the controller. So um, I think one of the biggest issues in eye care is you want to differentiate yourself. Differentiation is the key. I think we differentiate in our practice on a daily basis with the level of technology that we present in the assessment and the final diagnosis and treatment of our patients. I think we also differentiate with the quality of the care that we render. And all of you do this, but when you have an instrument that's probably one of your most commonly used devices, slit lamp or optic, let's be truthful, and you are substantially different, patients understand that that difference is a level of commitment to, to, by you to them. And they also see it as a level of technology stepping, stepping forward and the, uh, the participation between you and the patient then becomes a very different exchange. Um, it's, it's uh, honestly, in the beginning, this was a wild factor. A lot of the patients have been back and it's the second time around. The new patients are always astounded by the fact that they can indeed go ahead and have an examination and I'm sitting on the other side of the room and controlling everything and they really like it. Um, we don't do a lot of social media. Uh, we have, that's just not our style. Uh, we're busy enough and blessed, blessed with the fact that we're very busy and uh, we really don't do that. But in practices that are growing and practices that are differentiating against competition in the community, this is a great way to sort of amp up the awareness of your practice being a better opportunity for your patients uh, or individuals who attend to you. So um, I don't really deal with this side at all. We don't do, we don't do it, but I can assure you that the colleagues I know who have the system and we've talked about it extensively, they all tell me that everything in the practice goes up as a result of this part of the practice taking that step forward. So uh, next, please. So there's an increased demand for medical eye care. We all understand that. What's interesting, and this is, you know, my day-to-day, -day, I saw 44 patients today. So my day-to-day -day practice is about that, 40 to 45, maybe sometimes on a busy, busy day, must see 50. But 
the key is that most of my patients are seniors. And you would think, well, they've had cataract surgery, they've had this, they've had that. The demand for RX work is not that great. Excuse me, it's just the opposite. This is a very high demand group. And part of the reason that this is interesting is if you're gonna manage them medically, if you're gonna take care of their glaucoma, if you're gonna take care of their macular issues, if you're gonna help them with their visual needs relative to reduced acuity, if you're gonna manage dry eye, if you're gonna do cataract assessment, co-management, refractive assessment, co-management, um, all of those require you to invest on the medical side, but this tool is such a perfect adjunct or companion to that. And I find this to be a, a great fit in a practice that sees only medical patients, ostensibly. I mean, we really don't do any general eye care. We don't take vision plans at all. Uh, but I do a lot of refractions and it blends perfectly because it matches my other technologies that we have moved forward. And so it makes the whole office a technology haven. And patients really, really do appreciate that. Um, first line care, absolutely. You know, it keeps patients educated about your health care. Uh, optometrists are, as we know, we are the primary eye care physicians. Uh, love the fact that it's programmable. You'll be amazed by that. Uh, and it helps you understand the big picture of how to grow the practice from the inside out. And that's sort of my spin on why I think this is such an important device. So uh, next slide, please, Dave. I think I am just about done. Well, we got an audience poll here on this slide, uh, but you know, okay. what, what question, a question came in, Dr. Timmons, uh, on that last slide yeah. there related to, uh, related to medical uh, as to whether or not that this connectivity and all this sort of stuff, you know, the, the digital foropter really meaningfully frees you up to spend more time on medical or is that just? Oh, yeah. Well, first off in, in my practice, what it's done is it is if i'm doing the refractions it absolutely allows me to go much quicker because everything's being fed into the system there's no delays i walk in the room i have my one two three pattern that i produce uh, i mean look you could have your technicians go in and dial everything in but that's taking up their time right they've already done the measurements let them just go ahead and make the transfer the second part is my technicians the people i work with they love this device you know if they're going to do a if they're going to do this type of testing for a patient, somebody says, hey, look, you know, I came in today, it's my glaucoma follow-up, but I really would like to see whether I can improve my vision. Absolutely, happy to provide that service. The, the technicians love this off, this, this unit, and they can immediately just Bluetooth it to the EHR, which is fantastic. So yes, I think there are many places in the progression of the evaluation of the patient where this is a time saver, it's much more efficient, I think for whatever reason, I just find it less stressful. I don't know why. I think it's because you're sitting down and you're you're sort of in a you know, relaxed position. You're not standing, I, I stand up otherwise. And the other thing I like with this one is, I don't have to, and I know this is, for those of you who are not yet in presbyopia world, this is fantastic because I can actually see all the numbers that I'm working with without having to stand there and look around the foropter and get underneath my bifocal and try to see what's going on. And that, that's that's probably one of the more interesting aspects of this is that you're front facing to the patient and everything you're doing is in a print type that doesn't even require you to wear. I don't have to wear my glasses to do the refraction. Every other time if I'm in one of the other rooms where I might see that patient, I have to do that. So, yeah, I do think there's a lot of advantages to this. So here's our second audience poll tonight. Everybody gets a chance to participate again. This poll is about delegation in your practice. Uh, the poll should be live on your screen night, right now. And the question is, do you delegate your pretest, uh, things like lensometry and autorefraction? Um, do you delegate pretest and refraction to technicians or do you do it all yourself? And right now we are getting about 75% uh, delegate the pretest stuff, about 10% do the uh, pretest, delegate the pretest and refraction. And about 12% right now, do it all yourself. And that looks like the results have stopped coming in. So we're going to close out the poll right there. And I think that might have been your last slide, Dr. Timmons. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Timmons. Appreciate that. Uh, yep, you're right. Absolutely. That was the segue for Dr. Dr. Freed. Dr. Freed, I see you on the screen now to talk about telemedicine innovation and digital optometrics. You can see the slides. Yes, I can. Okay. Here we go. Uh, 
yeah, thank you for putting up the first one, and and thank you everyone for for joining uh, this evening. I know it's uh, getting late, um, and I will tell you uh, from someone that uh, graduated in uh, SUNY optometry in the mid '90s uh, when I knew Dr. Timmons back then as one of the uh, the gurus of our optometric profession. Uh, I never would have thought back then that I would be following him uh, in a webinar, and so it's uh, truly an honor to do so. So thank you for that. And thank you to uh, the Weikert team for, for having me uh, tonight. So uh, yeah, you can go down the other bullet points up to the 70% one. Um, and there's maybe one more. Maybe. Great, perfect. Yeah, so back, um, you know, and, and I think Dave gave you a little bit of my history. So, you know, I was, uh, came out of SUNY Optometry and I was in the, the optical retail environment. I had multiple stores and then I also had the wholesale uh, lab business that I sold to Essilor. And, and back in 2015, 2016, I was just looking at the, the landscape uh, of optometry and I was getting tons of uh, friends uh, in the industry that were coming to me and asking if I can assist them in finding doctors of optometry to fill in. And, and you know, the landscape is changing and has been changing. And yes, there's over 300 people in uh, 300 million people in the US and, and 200 million of them require some form of eye care. And of them, only 100 million are actually receiving an annual eye exam for a number of different factors as to why they're not coming uh, on, an, on an annual basis, that, that 100 million. Um, but the, the landscape is also changing in the optometry schools. Um, and so you have 70% of the graduates are, are, now, are now women, which is uh, a big positive, as Dr. Timmons uh, you know, implied earlier. There's more of a focus on medical eye care, uh, which is also fantastic, what they're teaching now in the schools. Um, but, but what we are finding um, is that uh, back then, at least in 2015 and 2016, there were new technologies that were coming out. And those technologies uh, were, in my humble opinion as an optometrist, were not really uh, you know, very responsible. Um, you know, they were direct to uh, patient, what they called direct to consumer technologies. Uh, that were refractive only solutions uh, and, and actually optometrists were being sort of pushed out into the cold uh, because it was really only ophthalmologists that were ultimately signing off on these uh, RXs that were being performed by these um, objective, um, you know, autorefractor type of um, hocus pocus kinds of stuff. And, and so, you know, I, I had an issue with the technologies that were out there at the time and I knew that we could figure out something that was uh, well, that was more patient-centric. And if you can go to the next uh, slide for a sec, Dave. So, you know, ultimately what I wanted to try and do is to develop something um, that, was, that actually kept the doctor-patient relationship intact. Um, uh, as I said before, a, a patient-centric but OD-driven model. Um, and I think that was critically important uh, that patients would be able to see their doctor, because most patients have three, four, or five questions they want to ask, uh, you know, their doctor, and so that they can have a synchronous visit with them. But also, just as importantly, uh, that we kept ocular health and refraction married together. Um, and I think that was a problem with uh, those early technologies that they were just refractive only solutions. And I really felt that they were being shortchanged because, listen, optometrists are the gatekeepers to the healthcare system. And as you know, uh, most patients are going to come and see us because uh, they're having trouble seeing for distance or they're having trouble seeing for reading. But when they sit in that chair, we're also looking for diabetes and hypertension and glaucoma and cataracts. And so all those technologies, whether they're cell phones on you know sticks or or whatever else they, they that they had developed, um, you know yes, they're going to solve the patient's problem for just seeing a distance and reading potentially, uh, but what, at what cost? Um, you know, are we, are we going to lose out on early detection of disease because uh, they've separated out refraction and ocular health? So that was a, a critical part of why I wanted to develop a technology to go ahead and, and uh, find a responsible solution, again, patient-centric and OD-driven. Um, okay, so we can go to the next slide. So ultimately what came about was we developed uh, digital optometrics and, and it does, and we're gonna get into what it, you know, the, the, the details of it, but it does boost efficiencies and reduce costs uh, because, um, you know, imagine like one doctor who is licensed in multiple states, let's say New York and California, 
Uh, they can examine one patient in Brooklyn, New York, and five minutes later, they're going to examine a patient in San Francisco, California. Um, and so imagine being able to expand your practice to locations where you're really not limited uh, by where you're physically located. Um, so you're, you're going to be able to utilize yourself as a doctor, being able to see patients in multiple locations, even if it's within the same state, um, or you can go ahead and utilize the digital optometrics network of providers when you're not available to, uh, to see patients. And so you can um, go ahead and, you know, seven days a week, you can, uh, you know, we have an open and a closed system, so we can actually provide doctors, or you can go ahead and utilize your own doctors seven days a week to see patients. And then, of course, there's the safety issue, what, you know, Dr. Timmons was referring to before, although we did, obviously, you know, we, we developed this well before COVID, um, but this improves distancing significantly. Uh, and then, you know, the exams have, uh, through this technology, uh, take less than 30 minutes. We actually have a number of, of customers that have seen three patients an hour through the technology. And what you're seeing here is a number of the different images uh, of the technology. And I'm actually going to take you through, uh, you know, it from the patient experience perspective. So if we can advance to the next slide, we're going to go relatively quickly through this. So, you know, the patient will come into your practice and uh, let's say the doctor is not there, although we, we are in environments where we actually work side by side with in-person doctors in, in multiple exam room settings, but the patient will come in and the doctor is always available seven days a week, as I said before. Uh, and so next slide, they will go ahead and fill out their ocular and medical history and their demographics on a tablet. And, and uh, that could also be done by a local technician or some sort of a telepresenter that actually, you know, brings the patient through the entire journey can actually help by putting it into a, um, you know, a, a laptop or, or, you know, a desktop. Uh, and actually, if you have an EMR, uh, we can actually go ahead and integrate with the EMR and push the information that's an existing patient into our system. Ours is a cloud-based system. And then what is going to happen is this facilitator or local technician will bring the patient into the pre-testing area, which is what you're seeing here. And what we do with the pre-testing area is we try to utilize uh, devices that you already have. So we try to reduce the CapEx by using what you have. Uh, and as you're, you're seeing here, uh, we're, we're using Rikert, um, you know, a, a, we can use an NCT uh, like the 7 uh, or 7CR. We can use, um, you know, retinal cameras and, and visual fields and, uh, you know, video slit lamps, uh, auto refractors, auto lens meters, uh, we can get involved in medical devices. We can get involved with topographers and V-scans and, and OCTs. Uh, but we integrate with hundreds of devices. And we, as I said, that's for the purposes of uh, reducing the CapEx, the certain minimum requirements that we have that we need in order to be able to examine both the anterior and the posterior side of the eye. Um, but again, uh, we try to utilize what you have. So all of this information is going to be pushed up through our machine interface software up to the cloud to be reviewed by the remote optometrist. And then the patient is led into the exam room, which is what you're seeing here. Um, and you can go to the next slide. And what's going to happen is a remote technician who is remotely based, works in our office in either New York or Cincinnati, and some of them are even working remotely from their home offices. Um, we have about 75 uh, remote technicians who uh, take control of peropters all around North America and perform full subjective refractions uh, utilizing the Rikert VRX digital foropter, and they will go ahead and uh, perform a full subjective refraction from unaided visual acuities all the way through the red, green, and binocular balance. And you can go to the next slide just to see a, an example of our call center here, where the uh, text will see the patient on the left side of the screen, and on the right side of the screen, they will have the, uh, the Rikert VRX digital uh, foropter software where they can control the actual foropter, and you can go to the next slide. And so, as I said, they'll, they'll control it. Next slide. Then what happens is they come off the screen after doing that initial subjective refraction. And by the way, in certain jurisdictions, you might be asking yourself, well, wait a minute, why? I may not want the refractionist to do it. I, I want to do it myself as an optometrist. And you can do that. You can skip the remote tech and go straight to the doctor. The doctor also has the ability to go ahead and take control of the Rikert VRX digital foropter. Um, and they can go ahead and refine anything that the remote tech did unless they do it completely themselves. But you're seeing here a picture of the doctor on the screen communicating live with the patient. And when they're communicating live with the patient, not only can they control the foropter, but they can also put up images of the retina on our whiteboard technology 
and circled the optic nerve and the macula. And on the patient side, they're seeing the pen mark moving sort of like you would on a NFL football game. It's a very engaging experience. They can give recommendations to lenses and give uh, recommendations for ocular health, follow-up assessment or referral for that matter. Um, and so, of course, critically, they can go, you know, important that they can answer any questions uh, that the patient might have uh, next slide before they ultimately sign off on the RX for glasses and or contact lenses, at which point, Dave, you can go to the next slide. Howard, we got a question that just came in here. It's perfectly relevant to the screen. Uh, oh, the, sure. the question is, is somebody's asking, is that doctor, assuming they're talking about the doctor they see on the screen here, me or another doctor? And I think the answer yeah. is it could be either, right? It could be either. Yeah, it's a great question. So we have both an open system, which means that Digital optometrics will provide not only the refractionist who performs the initial subjective, but we will also provide the doctor who is licensed in the state in which the patient is located. And we will also, in addition to that, get them credentialed on whatever plans uh, and, and uh, you know, get them linked to your location so that you can bill through their NPI number. And then, of course, there's the closed system, uh, which would allow you to be the doctor. And it, and it could also be a, a mix of the two. Um, so, you know, there could be times when you want to be the doctor for your own practice or your associates, or for that matter, you uh, certain days and hours that you want us to cover for you, and we can certainly uh, customize that based upon uh, your, your indications of what you want us to do. And then, you know, as a, you can go to the next slide, uh, then the doctor will answer those questions, and then uh, next slide, they can go ahead and uh, the prescription will print locally so that the patient can go into the dispensary to purchase whether it's the eyeglasses or, or contact lenses. So on, on this slide, uh, you know, this is really just a summary of what we just talked about, which is that it's a comprehensive eye exam, which is critically important for us that we, that we do everything as a comprehensive eye exam. It's not refractive only. There is real-time communication. This is synchronous. Um, and, and the exam cost is reduced substantially because this is not a fixed cost. Uh, currently, you're used to paying a doctor uh, for the full day. Uh, that they're they're available um, and with our model it's a variable cost you just pay on a per exam basis so if you have two exams that we're covering you for or seven exams or 30 exams you just pay on a per exam basis the patient experience is now exciting and enjoyable we actually go ahead and and run net promoter score surveys for those that don't know what that is uh, the fortune 500 companies use net promoter scores to assess uh, loyalty uh, and customer satisfaction uh, it's really a it's a main, the main question for NPS is would you recommend this product or service uh, to a friend or family? And it's on a 10 point scale. And uh, you have major companies like Apple and Amazon and Netflix, they have scores in the 50s and 60s, which are excellent NPS scores. Uh, our score for digital optometrics after performing 250,000 exams is in the upper 80s, which is unheard of. And actually we ran it based upon age and the older population actually gives us a higher score than the younger population because it's really a wow effect for them. The younger population is accustomed to telehealth. Uh, the older population is now as well because of COVID. We can go to the next slide. But uh, yeah, the, the older population does love it. <coughs> Excuse me. So now, um, you know, doctors can go ahead and conduct uh, exams during all business hours, seven days a week. There's greater access to care. I talked about there uh, being a variable cost. And you can actually go ahead and have one doctor that can examine patients in multiple locations. And the system is designed for utilization by not only the remote doctor, but also the on-site doctor. So it's the same exact equipment that you'd be utilizing just with a flip of a switch. So if you have an on-site doctor that's there using the uh, Riker BRX and they wanna leave at four o'clock, they just flip the switch and, and now uh, it can be remotely controlled, whether it's by the same doctor at home uh, or, or as, as, as Dr. Timmon says, actually, I probably wouldn't mind uh, seeing patients from the Bahamas. Uh, we've actually had patients uh, being seen by doctors in Israel. Um, so as long as there's an internet connection, uh, you really could be uh, seeing it and, and understand you have to be licensed where the patient is located. So that's just the other thing. But yeah, just a flip of a switch. OK, next uh, slide, please. So uh, the advantages for patients, um, you know, this was developed prior to, to COVID. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we saw the advantages, you know, for some of the reasons why I told you when I first started uh, speaking uh, earlier this evening. And because, you know, there are 
remote parts of the country where there is a lot of what we call dark locations, meaning there's they can't find doctors in remote parts of the country and even urban areas where there are difficulty in finding doctors for, for certain days and hours. Uh, we go into dim environments, what we call dim, which means there's a doctor you know, uh, in the location one, two or three days a week, but for whatever the reason is, maybe either because they can't find a doctor or for that matter, it just economically doesn't make sense to have a doctor on full those full days. Uh, we go into those dim environments, so they add us the other days and hours that the physical doctor you know, who's on site is not there. And then we go into high volume locations where there's a doctor in exam room one and we're in exam room two and three. Why would they do that? Well, that's really about meeting patient demand. Uh, you know, it's, it's about convenience. You know, in this world of Amazon, it's, it's all about convenience. We, we're reducing wait times, we're, we're lowering no-show rates. Um, and so everyone really wants to be seen at the same time. They all wanna be seen during lunch hours or on the evenings or weekends. And so by being able to have now multiple lanes being utilized in addition to the on-site doctor, which I love that idea because you now have the ability to even push some of the cases that perhaps aren't really perfect for telehealth to the on-site doctor who is available. Um, and so that's you know just many of the advantages of, of doing that. Next slide, great. And then advantages for optometrists. Well, listen, you know, work-life balance, as you know, is number one driver for a young optometrist. Now, um, it's you know I, I will tell you that uh, this is just one tool in the optometrist toolbox. And, and what's so phenomenal about our profession is that you really have the ability to do so many things now, and this is just one of them. Uh, to be able to practice in, in this mode. Uh, and, and so it could just be one tool in your toolbox and, uh, and, and just, you know, I think it's really exciting uh, that, that people for whatever the reason might be, whether it's due to the COVID uh, pandemic or because uh, you're taking care of elderly or children or other personal uh, you know, reasons why you need to be in a different state, uh, but still be able to have your practice. Let's say you're semi-retired and you wanna keep the revenues uh, strong and still be able to see your patients. So there's just so many different reasons why this is, these are advantages for optometrists that were just not possible with this technology a number of years ago. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so, so here's uh, the, the fully integrated, um, uh, whoops, uh, yep, that's, that's the one, yep, that's perfect. Um, and so, listen, you know, a, a lot of the other technologies that I talked about earlier that you know, the hocus pocus ones that I was saying were really refractive only solutions. Uh, you know, they, they have developed their own kinds of things uh, to be able to be utilized that are sold to you. And in our model, we're actually using, you know, equipment that is already trusted, trusted brands. Um, and so here, you know, like for instance, the, the, uh, the digital Peropter, the Peropter VRX by Reichert, and, and you'll see on the top line, um, the second to the right, uh, the second, all the way over actually, the fourth one over, that video slit lamp, which is probably uh, unique to our model. Um, and we and that's brought in uh, and distributed by Reichert. And it's a phenomenal unit um, that we teach local technicians how to utilize. To, and, and it's a 15 second video and you're able to take as many of them as you want. Uh, but we get to see Von Herricks and Cornea and Conjunctiva and Lib Margin and Lens. Um, but all, all, as I said before, we, we integrate into hundreds of devices um, so you have the ability to go ahead and try to replicate as closely as possible. And we don't perform dilations through this. Uh, we do recommend them uh, for the patients to come back from dilations. But we, you know, as you know, other than the dilation, uh, this is really as close of a replication to an in-person exam as possible. Uh, and that's really what we want to do. We want to replicate the in-person experience. But this, remember, is a supplement to the in-person experience, not a replacement to the in-person experience. Oh, here's a question, Howard, uh, relevant to this slide here. Somebody asked about, about all of these pretest things, fundus photography and so forth, wh whether that's archived for later viewing or does the doctor see those things in, in real time during the, the examination? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. No, uh, what happens is that the local tech will go ahead and bring the patient through all the pre-testing and then everything is uploaded. So it's not synchronous in that you're seeing it while the, the local tech is doing it, but it's within seconds after the local tech has completed doing it in the pre-testing, you will be able to uh, review everything while you're communicating live with the patient. So you'll be able to tell them, okay, I'm looking at your, your um, you know, the, the front surface of your eye now. And we also perform all of the, um, uh, the entrance tests like uh, pupils, cover on cover, EOMs, 
uh, with a webcam and we record that and send it up as well. Um, so within, uh, within minutes of this uh, being completed, you'll be able to be reviewing it while the refractionist is actually performing the initial subjective refraction. You can start reviewing it and then you'll be able to have a live conversation with the patient while you continue to review it in, in front of them. Uh, and so this last slide is really uh, just to let you know, I, I mentioned before we've performed over 250,000 exams. Our redo rates are a fraction of 1%. Uh, we have performed a research study with the Illinois College of Optometry uh, that is going to be published at, at ARVO at the national meeting this year. Uh, and that just proved out that uh, the results of our exams um, are similar to an in-person exam. We're actually now doing a long-term study with the University of Montreal, the optometry school there. And I know that one of the questions that's going to come up, so I'll just hit it now, is, is about insurance. Uh, yes, uh, all of the major vision insurance companies now reimburse uh, for uh, our technology, uh, from VSP to IMED, Davis, Superior, Spectera, uh, Medicare, and many of the state Medicaid uh, programs are, are reimbursing at the full rates as an in-person exam. So I know that will probably come up. And I think I'm going to pause here. I think the next slide is going back to you, Dave. Yeah, but let's take a let's take a break right here before we get into this and and bring um, Dr. Timmons back on if you're if you're still hanging around, Jim, to uh, answer a few questions that have come in uh, during both presentations. And uh, let me see if I can. Okay. Hi, Jim. I'm back. Uh, I think the first one uh, that I didn't get to yet was during your presentation, Dr. Timmons, asking. How does uh, a system like this, VRX, I assume, help when determining computer distance? And then there's another question related to close, uh, uh, close vision testing. Look, it, it has all of the standard formats that you would want. So you, have, you can do rod testing, you can do anything you like. Um, I've actually changed my perspective on that space and I, typically kind of move my patient out from behind the foreopter for near testing now, once we have the distance RX, and we talk about where are you located at? You know, show, show me your distance. You know, is it out here? Is it over here? Do you have two screens? Do you have four screens? I think the traditional concept of a standardized near point analysis is fading away um, with the advent of tablets and multiple workstations. So I'm much more concerned about the ergonomics of their space. And I think Howard would probably agree on this. Uh, you know, I typically have a lot of patients who are have a, multiple pairs of glasses because their workspace isn't their life space. You know, they're in front of screens all day and they have to read something here. So we get a set of lenses that give them max up here. The top is not distance, it's actually a computer. The bottom's reading and they'd like to take them off, put them on the desk and walk away. And then they put their regular specs on when they leave. Right, Howard? I agree 100%. Yeah, so I've, I've moved away from the near point. Now, the four opter stuff relative to cover tests, I think that's valuable. And you can do that with this device as well. There's no there's no restrictions on that. So we have a question about dilation as whether or not that's passe now. Um, and, and I know um, I, I would assume that the fundus cameras that you uh, that are compatible with the digital optometric system are non midriatic fundus cameras and you're getting a good view of the back of the eye. But what are you, what are what how do you respond to the question about dilation? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, uh, and, and I will tell you probably in 70% of the uh, clients that we're currently in, in right now in Innsbruck with them, uh, they're using Optos, uh, which is, you know, as you know, a wide field uh, non midriatic camera you know, going out 200 degrees. Uh, and so that's one option. Uh, I, the other 30% are using a 45 degree, you know, central view. Um, but, uh, but yes, I mean, you know, I, you have to also understand uh, what this is really utilized for. This is a great gatekeeper approach to optometry. Um, but again, as I said before, this is a supplement to the in-person experience, not a replacement. So, um, you know, so I'm not going to, uh, you know, stand here and say that, uh, you know, we need to eliminate dilations, um, you know, from, from our, from, from what we do. Uh, but I will tell you that we get a very good view of the retina with the uh, technology that's out there today. Yeah, I actually have the other side of that technology. I have the Zeiss Claris, yep. and I would submit that I have never seen the retina in that detail in my 38 years of practice. Uh, we we can do the four shot. Does it completely eliminate dilation? No, it doesn't. 
Does it give you the ability to dilate the patient less frequently to get to where you want to? Absolutely. Uh, in my diabetics, I rarely have to dilate them more than once a year or, or maybe even less simply because we see so much into the periphery with that camera. And the beauty of the camera is, and I'm, I'm gonna be very honest, uh, if you think you're doing a really good job with a BIO and a patient squeezing and tearing and moving and not going where you want, you are probably convincing yourself that the gold montanometer is still the standard of care for measuring IOP. It's not, colleagues. Uh, the camera that we have allows me to just stand there in front of it and go, oh, there's a microaneurysm. I didn't see that choroidal nevus because the patient wouldn't look in that direction. So I, I think the conjunction of those two demands, look, when a patient comes in with PVD complaints, everybody gets dilated. If they're high myope, they get dilated. But the current recommendations from our organization and the Academy of Ophthalmology do not say that you dilate the patient every year unless they have specific preconditions that would require that. You dilate the patient on symptoms. You dilate the patient on some form of cycle. But for the average person coming back for their general comprehensive exam who was completely healthy the last time you saw their peripheral retina with no new symptoms, you probably don't need a dilation every year. What you need is a comprehensive exam that covers all the material Howard did. And basically, we do this exact same thing uh, simply because we have all that connectivity as well. And I've added this into the system because this is the last piece in my technology leap. And it has really sort of cemented everything else together in a very nice way. So, Last question here, I think, is for Howard, is uh, how effective is it versus in agreement uh, with in-person testing? So I think you touched on that, uh, talking about the study at ICO. Yes, um, you know, the ICO ran um, that research study uh, to prove out that it was uh, similar to the in-person uh, experience, you know, and the results, the same results. So uh, it's, I mean, listen, you know, this is unlike, as I said, taking an objective uh, order refractor and going ahead and prescribing off of it. We're doing the same exact subjective refraction uh, that you would do if you were literally in, in inside uh, the exam room with the patient. So it's going to come up with the same exact uh, results as if you were as if you were there. So I, I don't think you're going to find any difference, um, you know, from 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 the remote exam versus the the in person exam. Someone made a comment about maybe it's time for a national license for optometry. You have any any thoughts on that, Howard? I, I love I love whoever just said that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've been preaching that one for quite some time, um, and I, I believe in, I, and I and I hear I see Jim wants to say something about that, so I'll let you I'll let you knock it out of the park for that one. <laughs> yeah, you know I, Howard and I agree for probably the same reasons and different reasons at the same time. I've been asking our national organization to come up with a way to homogenize the graduate degree, you know, the professional degree in optometry for at least 20 years. The problem is the states have these vested interests. And you see that, you know, sort of nationally on a political basis, you know, regardless of what's red or blue, everybody has their own vested interests and they have their own needs. And there's a lot of protectionism that took place. I think that's just bad for the profession. I think it tends to skew people towards locations and it doesn't allow for even and sort of on need distribution of professionals medicine got by that a long time ago that was the best thing they ever did was to, to make the license universal and allow you to go everywhere i think that's just absolutely critical so uh i, I also would tell you you're probably not going to see it anytime soon <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think we're going to see this anytime soon. I, I, I spoke at the 100th an, uh, anniversary of, of ARBO, uh, the Association of Regulatory Boards of Optometry, and, and, and asked that same exact thing about uh, license portability. And we're seeing it really, uh, a lot of this going on now during COVID, where you can get temporary licenses in many states uh, with an outside license. Um, and, you know, but it's temporary and, uh, you know, they're going to revert back. And I think, I think as Dr. Timmons said, it, it really is about protectionism, uh, but we do need to to do something about that. That was a great question. Yeah. So uh, a few closing comments here about uh, about the Foropter VRX, which Dr. Timmons utilizes and, and is compatible with the digital optometric system. Uh, a few of the things that make it unique. One is the retractable prisms. Uh, you, you look at some of the auto Foropters on the market and they're pretty thick and chunky. Uh, and rather than having patients staring through a big stack of lenses and plastic, we have a very, very thin um, uh, 
aperture area on our autoferopter VRX, and that's made possible by the fact that the prisms slide in and out when you utilize them only, so right. that normally those are retracted and out of the way. The, the lens exchange uh, and all the motors on this instrument are really fast and really quiet. Uh, next time there's an in-person trade show, which I hope is not too far off, uh, come and take a look at one if you haven't seen one, and I know you'll be impressed by how quick the lens exchange is and how quiet the lens exchange is. And, that, and that's part of the patient wow factor also that Dr. Timmons talked about earlier. You know, it's not only that the doctor is 10 feet across the room, that these lenses are flying by quickly and quietly, it's really impressive. Um, we've got a, a split cylinder test. Uh, you see there the red green, uh, and that, that enables uh, patients to uh, see one and two at the same time and maybe save you from having to flip back and forth so many times. Uh, and another thing about the system that's really unique and advantageous, and this plays particularly well into the digital optometric situation, is that this device plays well with others. It is not a closed loop system. Because you buy a Rikert VRX does not mean you need to buy a Rikert autorefractor and a Rikert lensometer. Of course, we'd love for you to do that, but if you're happy with your existing autorefractor and lensometer, you can buy a, do, a new digital autoferopter and it will integrate uh, with almost um, anything that's out there. Um, the, the touch screen and the controls are very logical and well laid out. They're also very, very robust. You put your hands on this instrument and you notice that it's made out of metal. feels very, very robust. Uh, we take a lot of pride in, in our quality uh, and anybody that uses a record for Opter knows that. These are made in Buffalo, New York, where I am here. So uh, uh, Reichert is the only major manufacturer of ophthalmic instruments in the US. And we've been manufacturing instruments in the Buffalo area since somewhere around 1920 or so. Um, we are, by the way, just in case you didn't know this, the word foropter with an OR belongs to Riker. We invented that word. It's a registered trademark of Riker. Everything else is supposed to be called a refractor, although the term foropter with an ER has, has, has kind of become like Kleenex these days. But that word foropter is something that we created. So Dave, I, mean, I have to stop you for a second. Dave, I learn something from you every time I talk to you. This is the first time I've ever heard this. That's a pretty amazing piece of history that you guys own the own the copyright on the own the uh, patent to that. Nice. Own the word, own the registered trademark on foropter and also trademark. the shape and configuration of the of the instrument is is registered to Rikert as well. So these devices are, uh, are 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 a long part of our heritage, and they've been they've been built in Buffalo, New York, uh, since before I was born. Uh, and and we have a lot of different options. We have manual foropters. We have white and black and plus and minus and illuminated and non-illuminated. A couple of different models of digital uh, foropters. Uh, so. Um, we are the foropter company. We've been making foropters for a long time and, 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 and we do uh, better than anybody else at it. Uh, we can do a virtual demo for you. So these days, and we had this capability before, uh, it was cool, but um, now it's really cool and really necessary. Uh, there's a picture of uh, one of our application specialists, Kristen down there. Uh, we can walk you through the system uh, over a, 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 an online meeting, answer your questions, show you how it gets used and all that type of stuff in real time. Uh, if you wanna, if you wanna uh, do a virtual demonstration of the system, please contact us after the webinar and we can set that up for you. Uh, I, we already did the questions. Um, I think the last thing I wanna mention here is we've got a couple of other uh, webinars coming up in our, our spring education series here. We've got a great webinar coming up next week uh, Wednesday, the 24th, uh, to talk about uh, ocular response analyzer, corneal hysteresis, and IOPCC. I know that's another technology that Dr. Timmons uses in his practice. We're going to have Mike Ahmed, Paul Singh, Felipe Medeiros, and Justin Schweitzer talk about the evidence and um, the importance of, of those uh, glaucoma vital signs you may be missing. And then uh, April 8th, we have an interesting webinar on the CATS tonometer prism. CAT stands for correcting applination surface. Uh, and, and Dr. McCafferty, the inventor of that new prism, along with Nate Radcliffe and Paul Karpecki are gonna talk about how that can help uh, you make better IOP measurements with your existing Goldman tonometer. So uh, that's all I have tonight. I wanna thank uh, Dr. Fried and Dr. Timmons again for joining us. When I close the webinar out here, uh, you'll get a survey. We ask that you just spend one extra minute and please uh, fill out that survey so we know how we did. We look forward to seeing you all in the future. 
on another webinar and hopefully in person at the trade show sometime soon. Thanks everybody for joining us. Have a good night. That was good. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.